Technical systems are working well. Mr. Gonzalez Pons, now, please, two minutes. Los colegas, ninguno de nosotros pasa. Colleagues, coronavirus will one day be a thing of the past. And we have to uh, treat it as a serious subject, which is what it is. We can't pretend it's just going to go away. The virus is more effective, swifter, more dangerous uh, than the measures we're putting into place to try and put checks on it. And with winter coming on, it will only become more severe. But we're still getting our reality mixed up with what we want. We all want this nightmare to be over. But it's not going to be over if we don't treat it as the healthcare emergency, the economic and social emergency that it is. We're wrong when uh, we were wrong when we said the coronavirus would be uh, uh, done with by the time the summer was over. We were wrong when we said that a vaccine would be available before Christmas. We're putting together vaccine plans, but no vaccines are available. We need to gird our loins and get ready for a battle that's going to last years. In only eight months in my own country, Spain, 50,000 people have died of coronavirus. One million people have been infected. Thousands of people are infected every month. This is the only thing we should be focusing on right now. Members of the Council, don't you think it's time for a joint strategy to fight back against this pandemic? How many more people will have to die in Europe for that to happen? Our continent is facing the health care, the very lives of millions of people, the collapse of our health care systems, the collapse of our small and medium-sized enterprises, millions of families being able to put food on the table, pay for heating, pay for the clothes on their backs. And so uh, with all of this going on, it makes it even more incomprehensible that Boris Johnson is burning every bridge with the European Union, condemning the UK's economy. If Donald Trump loses the election, Boris Johnson will have no friends left in the world. We need to be responsible here. We need to stand united and back our negotiator. And we need to ask our negotiator to negotiate for all of us, on behalf of all of us, for the good of the UK as well. We need to work together, because working together will ensure our survival. Thank you. Thank you. We have Kachi Piri connected uh, from our office in The Hague. Please. Mr. Barnier, when we last discussed the negotiations in the context of Mr. Hansen's and my report on the EU-UK partnership in June, we only had 204 days left before the end of the transition period. Today, that number is down to 73. Prime Minister Johnson then gave assurances that all it would take to come to an agreement was a little oomph and self-imposed a deadline, first in July and then on 15th of October. But instead of a real engagement in the negotiations, the UK decided to put forward an internal market bill which breaches international law, jeopardizes the Good Friday Agreement and ruined the good faith between the negotiators. And here we are, in the midst of a second wave of the corona crisis, with all its economic consequences, and the UK government, for reasons no one can really grasp, decided to walk away from the negotiation table, one minute before midnight. Because we do not need a deal in 73 days. We need it within two weeks. Only then will this parliament be able to ensure the agreement's full democratic scrutiny. Because, President, let this be very clear to the UK government. Since the beginning of the transition period, the European Parliament has diligently and consistently taken its responsibility in reaching an agreement, because we believe that finding one would be in the interest of both the EU and UK citizens. But under no circumstances will we now be bullied by Mr Johnson into rubber stamping just any last-minute deal after the UK government chose to run down the clock on the negotiations since February. And our position has not changed. We have always been very clear regarding our red lines, top social, labor and environmental standards, fair competition, effective governance, a sustainable agreement on fisheries and full compliance with the withdrawal agreement. The parliament remains fully committed to a comprehensive agreement with the United Kingdom. But let me draw a clear line in the sand. 
If the UK government does not remove those provisions in the Internal Market Bill that are in clear breach of international law, this Parliament cannot and will not consent to any agreement. And finally, let me underline once again that as European Parliament, just as the Council, we are absolutely united in our support for our negotiator, Michel Barnier. Mr. Barnier, we wish you the very best for the coming few weeks of hopefully intensified negotiations with a good outcome. Now it's up to the UK government to deliver on its promises for a comprehensive agreement in line with the political declaration and the withdrawal agreement to which Mr. Johnson himself signed up to. We on our side are ready. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Loiseau, please. President. Boris. President, one day Boris Johnson said he would rather die in a ditch than postpone Brexit. And as things stand today, the negotiations are between a rock and a hard place. When negotiating, you need to be very careful in uh, any mistakes that might be made. The Internal Market Bill was one of the mistakes made by Boris Johnson. It was supposed to consolidate Johnson's power, but by threatening to breach international law, what he did was pull Europeans together, um, standing in unity. The fact is that, that uh, when you're driving along a dangerous road, you need to make sure you stick to the rules. The Prime Minister also thought that by setting the 15th of October as a deadline, he would put uh, fear into the hearts of Europeans. But the fact is that negotiations are going to start up again at any point. When you want to reach a goal, you have to make sure that you're not making unnecessary pit stops. The British government decided to try and divide and rule by putting fisheries at the heart of every discussion. But no one was fooled. The real issue at hand, the issue of concern for all member states, is the risk of unfair competition on the doorstep of the single market. And this is a subject that had yes to been worked out. Fisheries hasn't been worked out yet either. We haven't worked out a dispute settlement mechanism. Even when uh, the British going back on the withdrawal agreement means that our trust has been eroded. It's not what it was in the past. Our ditch would be a no-deal scenario, and that a hard place would be a bad agreement. We don't want to see our businesses dying out, faced with unfair competition when it comes to health standards or environmental or social standards. We don't want our fishery sector to die out either. It should not have to deal with uh, the consequences of a decision that it didn't make. Brexit. So there's a narrow pathway forward, respecting the sovereignty of all parties, respecting that the interests of all can be served. And we need to move forward at a good clip along this road. And to avoid a disaster, Mr. Johnson, open your eyes to the needs of businesses. Respect the withdrawal agreement and move negotiations out to the deadlock you put them into. You're at the wheel, Mr. Johnson, and you're the one who can stop any accidents happening. Thank you very much, Mr. Sloeso. One minute, Mr. Beck, please. President. Thank you, President. Trade negotiations with the maximum demands for a level playing field on EU terms, pre-Brexit fishing rights and continued ECJ jurisdiction. Britain wanted a Canada-style trade deal and signalled some flexibility. The EU, in contrast, barely moved. A negotiation is a discussion between parties with divergent views, but a shared interest in finding a compromise. The EU, notably Germany, has a vast trade surplus with the UK. Yet the German presidency and the Commission remain committed to an unequal treaty on EU terms and enforceable to an uh, and enforceable before the EU's imperial court. Merkel and von der Leyen know not to negotiate because they know not when to compromise. That way, they will not have their way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Berg. One minute. Mrs. Reinke. Colleagues, I might not like to say it, but I think it has to be said also here in this house. 
Boris Johnson has been lying to the people in the UK. The 350 million pounds for the NHS after Brexit. No customs checks between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. And then this oven ready deal that basically just needed signing on the future relations between the EU and the UK. Come on, these lies have to stop. If we want to turn this around, truth has to be spoken. First, Brexit is a mess. Second, Finding a solution to this mess is not going to be easy for either side. But thirdly, and I think that this is important, there might not be a good outcome to this, but there are many different levels of how difficult this can become. So, Prime Minister, stop blaming others for your own actions. Take responsibility and come back to the negotiation table and avoid the worst outcome for the people in the UK. You owe it to them. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Reinke. One and a half minutes, Mr. Bourgeois. For the Brexit nadert nu het uur van de waarheid. Colleagues, we're rapidly approaching the hour of truth. I'm pleased to hear that the aim here is to reach a partnership a partnership that will go above and beyond the CETA deal. The consequences of a no-deal would be terrible, added to the recession due to the pandemic. We know that this would be an extremely difficult loss. 1% of European GDP losing 1.2 million jobs, facing structural difficulties in the years to come. And for North Sea countries, the situation is even more serious. Just look at Flanders. 2.5% of Flanders' GDP will be lost, and millions of jobs are at stake. So a deal must be reached. We must do everything to reach that deal. Mr. Barnier, I'm particularly in favor of your approach. I think both sides need to, to state their respect for their sovereignty, and there needs to be a guarantee of uh, when it comes to... Um, fisheries, governance, the level playing field, everything must be done. But both sides also have to be pragmatic. We heard also what Mr. Shevchevic said. Uh, there are issues still around the single market. Luckily, we heard a positive message from the House of Lords, and uh, we wish you every success. Thank you, Mr. Bourgeois. One minute. Mrs. Villeneuve. Muchas gracias. Hace Thank you. 52 months ago, 52% of people decided to leave the European Union. And, uh, well, that leaves us in the situation where we are. Let me recall that it was 51.8% who supported Brexit. The majority in Northern Ireland wanted to stay. We have now ended up in a situation where there are all sorts of things going on and there's no cooperation, you, particularly on the British side. The European Union should not act in the same way as our British partners. We need to keep an open attitude and try and support all our citizens. We need to ensure that there are no consequences for, as, or as few consequences as possible for our industries and the raw materials sector and others. But the most important thing is citizens. We need to ensure that their rights are guaranteed. We also need to change our policies because we also face a health crisis and from this crisis we want to see a strong pillar of social rights, a strong health pillar and make it sustainable. Thank you, Thank you very much. One and a half minutes, Mr. Pueda. Thank you, President. Uh Another European Council goes on without a concrete advances on Brexit. In addition, even when the deadline is ever closer, I hope for a good deal that ensures that citizens and enterprises can continue to live and operate normally, both in the UK and in the EU. We are in the middle of one of the worst economic crises of our history. We are obliged not to worsen it with the political games. On the other hand, Brexit is a reminder that border exchange, as we all know. Today, 
Support for Scottish independence is a sky high in the latest polls with about 58% of the vote. The future of Scotland is in the Scottish hands and we all hope that Westminster will again give an example to the world on how to tackle with this kind of situations. London needs to show again how a mature democracy behaves. The UK needs to remind the EU that a referendum is something to agree on, not an excuse to put political rivals in prison like Spain has done. Very soon, Scotland will vote again to decide its future. And the House of European Democracy must be wide open for their immediate return. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now two minutes, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Leaders at this month's summit covered some pivotal topic, topics for our union. I fully support further EU coordination in terms of the pandemic and ambition in our fight against climate change. However, it is the ongoing negotiations with the United Kingdom that will have the most immediate and severe effects for my home country of Ireland. I have always been optimistic that when it came down to it, a deal would be reached. This I drew from the competency and fairness in which I have seen Michel Barnier do his great work. But recently our confidence lessened in this regard because of the shifting sands of Boris Johnson's desires and his collection of supporters in Parliament who seem more than willing to not only contradict themselves but also contradict the foundation of the United Kingdom's reputation by voting to willingly breach international law. On paper, with our years of close cooperation, the re remaining issues on Brexit seem achievable. The sharing of fishing rights and policing state subsidies to industry should not be deal breakers to close allies for 47 years. The real problem is the lack of trust in the seriousness of any commitments the United Kingdom might give, which was most distinctly displayed by the abrasive introduction of the Internal Market Bill and the legal justification for same. Sometimes we get the sense that the United Kingdom is more concerned with short-term optics than long-term substance. Nobody in the EU, Ireland and indeed the United Kingdom, if they are truly honest, wants an extremely disruptive no deal. There is a danger that a last-minute agreement it could break down under the multitude of legal disputes within a year or so. This must be avoided. To my friends in the United Kingdom, I say, there is room for a deal in line with your previous agreements that will finally provide certainty to businesses and citizens and divide economic catastrophe. I plead with you to meet the EU halfway and ensure that ordinary people do not become casualties of ideology. Mr Johnson, bin the bluster and get the deal done. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Two minutes, Mr. Silva Pereira. Uh, excuse me, Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, as Rapporteur of this Parliament for the implementation of the withdrawal agreement, I would like to, to express my support to the European Commission and uh, uh, Vice President Sefcovic for their efforts to ensure full compliance by the UK uh, of the withdrawal agreement and their commitments under international law. We've always said that trust is a prerequisite for a sound and future economic relationship, and we mean it. And now that uh, the UK internal market bill is under discussion between the House of Lords and the House of Commons, this Parliament recalls that we expect nothing less than full compliance of the withdrawal agreement. As to the negotiations of the future relationship, I would also like to express full support to Michel Barnier and his team um, and thank him for his remarkable patience and the responsible and firm manner in which he is pursuing the goal of reaching an unprecedented but also fair and balanced agreement. I can imagine that uh, Mr. Boris Johnson is having great fun playing with Brexit, playing uh, with the, the no deal scenario and the blame game. But I believe that citizens and businesses uh, 
uh, expect a much more responsible attitude. But let me say that I don't see how Mr. Boris Johnson can win the blame game, the blame game in this case. He was, we are running out of time, yes, but he was the one to refuse any extension of the transition period. He was the one to announce the breach by the UK of the withdrawal agreement and uh, uh, international law commitments. He was the one to refuse to apply the commitments uh, on the play, level playing field on the state aid that were already agreed as objectives in the political declaration. And he is now the one who is refusing um, to receive Michel Barnier and took the decision to suspend the negotiations. So I believe that uh, we need a responsible attitude. The EU has shown political will to reach an agreement. We are waiting to see the same attitude from, from the part of the UK government. Thank you very much. Now, two minutes. Mr. Peterson, Morten Peterson. Thank you very much. I'm going to be speaking Danish, and I bring my greetings from Copenhagen. Brexit, in every way, is tragic, and it's completely incomprehensible why Brexit would be a good idea. Since the Second World War, all European countries have worked to remove barriers for trade. And now we're sitting here to negotiate how we can make trade more complicated with one another. And that just doesn't make any sense at all. And s but they've made their decision. We have to respect it. But we should not respect that EU companies, UK companies have to compete with our companies on unfair basis. And also, I've visited the fishermen of Denmark in Tuberon, and I've discussed this with farmers in southern Jutland. I've discussed this throughout Europe and the service sector everywhere. Everywhere we hear the same basic message. Brexit is complicated. This is going to cost us a lot of money. This is, is going to cost us welfare. And from the EU, we have to stand together. We've done so up until now. And, of course, thank you very much to Michel Barnier for his negotiations. But we have to make a final attempt to find an agreement. It's not going to be easy. And as we heard our colleagues say, there are enormous problems with fisheries. There are enormous problems. Then we talk about governance, uh, what governance is going to apply in the future. But the U.K. has to understand when they create doubts as to whether they will even respect the agreements they actually sign themselves, then, of course, the rest of us become skeptical as well. So that we have to be able to trust one another in the future. EU has to be uh, fair. But thank you for this possibility, and all the best to Mr. Barnier in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Peterson. One minute, Mrs. Hutasari. Didn't. I have a dream. I want all member states to do Brexit. As EPP President Manfred Weber has put it, if Brexit felt like a success, it would be the beginning of the end of the EU. So that reveals that if UK leaves the EU without a deal, it means that EU has not even tried to be fair. I have a message for Boris Johnson. Defend your fishing waters, etc. You have now an opportunity to take your sovereignty back. Use it. Thank you very much, Mr. Hutasari. One minute to Mr. Utason. Thank you, President. Well, firstly, may I just state my full support for Michel Barnier and his negotiating team uh, for the months to come in the Brexit negotiations. Today, however, I'd like to talk about the fact that the Council did not talk about climate change, which is what we would have liked to see. The law that we put forward needs to be adopted by the European institutions and the majority of EU member states. What's more, we need to align all 
all our policies to that objective. And yesterday the Parliament failed with the vote on the CAP and we as Greens are not happy with that vote. They won't be defending our biodiversity, our transition in our production model. So that's the CAP and we're going to have a black hole when it comes to fighting climate change. But there's a different place where we can't afford to fail. And that has got to do with cooperation. We cannot manage the millions and billions of euros that we put aside for this if we're not cooperating on the change in our model. We can't be investing in fossil fuels, in motorways. We need to avoid that, and I hope that everyone will work together for the same. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Schultz, one minute. Señor Barnier, la falta. Thank you, President. Well, Mr. Barnier, the lack of an agreement with the United Kingdom is very bad news for both parties, but particularly bad for European fishermen and farmers. This is creating increased uncertainty in a sector which has been struck by price problems in many countries of the EU. There's one challenge in the CAP and another in Brexit for farmers. Four billion euros are exported from Spain to the United Kingdom. Wine, fruit and vegetables and olive oil. 10% of agri-food products are imported from Spain to the United Kingdom. I would ask the Commission which measures is it going to implement to support the agri-food industry? When does the Commission intend to activate the five billion emergency reserve for Brexit? And let me also say to Mr Puigdemont that uh, he has gone too far. He is distinguishing, he's not distinguishing between a legal and illegal referenda. The Brexit referendum was legal, his was illegal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Schultz, one and a half minutes. Thank you very much, President. And thank you, Mr. Barnier, also for those very clear words you've spoken today. But where are we really today? All citizens, our society, the economies on both sides of the channel really need clear language. Johnson was just concerned about the basic slogans of his Brexit campaign. In other words, is he going to achieve British sovereignty or the British going in the future to also follow our standards? Access to the single market. Are the British products going to be uh, entering our market unhindered? Uh, are the service providers going to be move through, uh, moving throughout the EU? Deregula deregulation, is that going to be allowed? Is the financial world in London going to be able to work with us? Ca fisheries for the British. Uh, what about the countries surrounding the North Sea? Are they going to be able to fish where the fish are swimming? What about stocks of fishers? So these are red lines. Please. Uh, don't let the clock r run down and suddenly have the parliament and the member states have to uh, have a contract, uh, uh, an agreement at the last moment because this could go very wrong indeed, both in the parliament and in the EU member states. What we need is an agreement with our neighbors, but one of quality that's very clear to the EP. Governance level playing field, uh, environmental standards, and an agreement on fishery and the completely, complete implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. Thank you, Now, Mr. Schultz. Thank you. 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 Thank you.